I'm in terrible pain almost all the time. And I do mean terrible. If, if in my previous life, when I was healthy, I had ever felt like I always feel now, I would have immediately gone to the emergency ward. But it's not helpful. There, as far as I can tell, as far as I've been informed for that matter, there isn't anything that can be done about the condition that I'm in. And that's rough. I have to remind myself all the time of what I should be doing, even to continue living for that matter. And I'm constantly reminding myself to be grateful and as an act of courage. And I, I do explain that a little bit beyond order. Something I really realized about gratitude is that gratitude at one level is an act. It's a voluntary act of courage. And I'm not trying to make out a case for myself being particularly courageous. That isn't what I mean. I mean that it's a risk to be grateful. It, it's a decision that opens you up in some ways. And you sort of grateful despite it all. Hmm. It's, an, it's a great gratitude, I suppose, as a, as a marker of faith. And, and that faith is even in some sense belief in the impossible. Despite all this, it's good. And I have to remind myself of that all the time. And I, you know, I do, I do that with prayer. I mean, I say grace with my wife. And at our, we only share one meal together. But we always say grace. And I actually think in some sense, that's a really good part of my day, that little, the time we do that. Um, and that comes as somewhat of a surprise. And, and it's a relatively recent practice for the two of us. Not that we weren't trying to be grateful before, but we've both gone through our respective hells in the last two years. Because um, my wife had a very terrible cancer. It was terrible and terrible surgical complications. And she was on death's doorstep for months and months and months. Um, and in any case, we remind ourselves constantly, constantly to be grateful. And I'm always trying to watch what I say and, and to feel it out so that I don't, so that I use my words carefully. Like if you're acting in your own self-interest, because you're a community that stretches across time, you have to take your own future self into account constantly. And so impulsive selfishness is not useful, even selfishly. And, and so you can make the most out of yourself, I believe, without taking anything away from anyone else. It's, it's only beneficial. Now, you know, people might be annoyed at you because you're more successful on some dimension than they are. And perhaps that hurts, but well, if to deal with that, we'd have to eradicate the possibility of ever being better at anyone, of <laughs> anyone ever being better than anyone else at anything. And it doesn't seem to me that we want to push equality that far. That's yes. Bad. And I think at the dark, the darkest edges of the e demand for equality have that horror at, at the root. It's like, well, you're going to take away from everyone what they have to offer by insisting that everything is equal. It's like, no, no, you want people to be able to trade the best they have with other people. That's a good deal for everyone. Every ideal is a judge. And that makes perfect sense because an ideal is something to which you aspire. And the gap between you and that ideal, if it's your ideal, is felt as judgment. Hmm. And so that's one of the reasons people are very afraid to have an ideal, to make it, that's why I wrote, do not hide things in the fog. It's like, well, you should lay out an ideal. You should pursue an ideal. Why wouldn't you? Well, when you make your ideal explicit, it turns into your judge. Well, then you can listen to that judge and, and move forward and transform. But, you know, it's pretty damn harsh. Because to, especially to begin with, you posit an ideal, especially if you're in a mess. God, every bit of you is being judged as unworthy. Yeah. <laughs> There's endless reasons not to want that. The mercy comes from saying, this is the ideal, but the expectation of judgment that I'm going to be at that right away is false. 
So let me appreciate myself right here where I am in this journey with all of my faults, however many they are, open up my entire closet of internal monsters, pet them on the head and say, okay, here we go, eliminating more of those and becoming more like the ideal, surrendering to the journey rather than that expectation. And there, the judge no longer carries the sting and the bite and the harshness because it's you're judging yourself according to a timeline where you're hoping to get closer to this. Yes, well, and the hallmark starts to become improvement. Right. Right. It's exactly. Like, and that's great. That's a that's that's a that's a really sustaining, um, um, that's a really this sustaining process too. Because technically speaking, again, um, seeing yourself move towards a desired goal is the essence of the positive emotion that nourishes us. And I mean that technically. That's dopaminergically mediated incentive reward. And so you don't have to get to the goal. You have to aspire to the goal and move towards it. And that then that doesn't even matter if the goal recedes, which it will as you approach it, because mm -hmm. your, you know, your ability to conjure up what constitutes the ideal is going to become more sophisticated as you move towards it. And you might think, well, that's terrible, but it isn't because it means the game doesn't have to end. <laughs> Right? Because if you may, you hit the ideal, yes. it's like, oh, well, game over, reset, you know, but no, no, that isn't <laughs> going to be how it works. It's just, it's going to get better and better and better. And it, it's, it's why it's life is the perfect game. I mean, if you have a really good, for those of us who've played video games, you have a really good video game or even a really good book or even a really good movie series or a show and it comes to the end and you're like, Oh, there's a huge letdown at the termination of this thing that's been incredibly engaging, mm -hmm. especially Even if, if you win. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You win and you mm. get this moment satisfaction, but it's replaced almost immediately by the disappointment of the cessation of the game and the recognition that you're in a finite game when you really want to be playing the infinite game. And that's what life is, the infinite game of renewal of life. And that's why it's so good. We'll never replace it. It can't get better. And it's hard as hell. <laughs> and it's hard as hell at the same time. And that's that's the way we would want it. Well, it seems like that's the way we want it. I mean, that's another thing I talk about a little bit in the new book is like, well, when you look back on your past, it's generally having done something difficult that you remember positively, I would say. As you improve, the probability that each improvement will produce a further improvement increases. And so perhaps the... The downside is the cataclysmic catastrophe that you can engage upon if you reproduce your moral failings. But the upside is that each improvement produces an increment in the probability of the next improvement. And I've seen that. It's a truism among behavioral psychologists. I mean, although they don't generally phrase it that way. If you're a behavioral psychologist, and I am a behavioral psychologist, what you do is you find out what essentially you help per a person establish their aim and then you break down what they're trying to do into attainable units and you negotiate with them you say well look you know um well i'm not they say i'm not making use of my time very well spending three hours a day playing video games and you say well okay hypothetically how much time would you like to spend playing video games and they say well i could probably spend an hour a day without it interfering with the rest of my life. Which is kind of the issue, right? Because if you play video games, fine. But maybe three hours means that you're not doing your homework or something, and that's not a good game. So you say, okay, well, I want to play for an hour a day. It's like, okay, well, can you shift to an hour a day right now? And this is supposed to be an honest conversation. And the person says, no, I've tried that lots of times. Every time I try, I just fail. And so you don't say, well, quit failing, go play one hour a day, and the problem will be solved. That's a stupid strategy. You say, okay, well, look, you think about this and don't agree to do this unless you think you will do it because otherwise it's just a waste of both of our times. It's like, do you think that you could track how much time you've spent playing video games for one week? Don't change anything, just track it. And they think, yeah, I could probably do that, but I might miss a couple of days and think, okay, fine. So here's the deal. Five out of the next seven days, you just track how much time you spend playing video games. And the person says, I think I can do that. Because that's what you want them to say. You want them to succeed at the improvement. It's not much of an improvement, but it's something, right? Then they come back and they say, well, yeah, I was playing about four hours a day. And so you say, okay, well, fine. Good work, man. You've got to track. Now we know what, we know the parameters of your problem. It's actually a little worse than you thought. 
but at least you had enough sense to measure it. We know where you're at. Okay. Do you think you could cut that down to three and a half hours every day? And the person thinks, "Mm, no, I'm pretty weak-willed. I don't think I could manage that. You say, well, how about this? Do you think that two of the next seven days you can only play for three hours? You think you can manage that? And you don't, you're not cynical about this. You're not insulting the person, any of that. It's like, because you don't care. All you care is that they make some incremental movement towards their goal. And the person thinks about that if they have any sense and they take their weakness into account and they think, I think I could probably do that. And then they come back the next week and they say, I managed to spend three hours a day playing video games for three days and the rest were four hours. And you say, good work, man. You've just got rid of 12.5% of your problem. You're one-eighth of the way to fixing it in one week. And, you know, the person isn't going to be all that thrilled with themselves because they don't do the arithmetic and they don't do the projection. They think, well, I'm still pretty damn useless. I'm playing 25 hours worth of video games a week. It's nothing to pat myself on the back for. It's like, yes, it is. It's definitely... It's a marked, measurable improvement, and it's a move in the right direction. You know, and then you say, okay, well, on the days you succeeded, how did you manage to succeed? And is there a way that you could do it for four days next week? How about that? Or, or maybe you could even try five days. Do you think you could do that? And then you also tell the person, look, the other thing you've got to understand is you're not going to improve like this. You're going to improve like this. So some weeks you're going to come back and say, geez, I backslid completely and I like played for four hours a day for seven days. But it doesn't matter because that doesn't mean you failed. It just means that you slid back. You want to calculate it over a month or something like that. And, you know, generally speaking, a month later, the person's down to something like two hours a day. And you've figured out ways of filling their time in with something productive otherwise. and, And they're on their way. And the general consequence of that is that every time they manage an accomplishment, they get a little stronger in character, they get a little bit more confident in their ability, they get a little bit less racked with self-disgust, they get a little bit more hopeful about the future, and they get more confident that they can make another change. And if you're patient, and you have to be patient with yourself that way, it's like you reward those incremental improvements and you don't get all cynical about them, and you think, okay, just imagine what would happen if you kept doing that every week for 10 years. And the answer to that is, things would be so much better for you that you can't even imagine it.